welcome to this session for CMA final students. This is your paper number 20, section B, business valuation. And in this session, we are going to start revision of your study note number six, titled as valuation models. Let me remind you that these are revision videos and in nutshell, in a limited period of time, we will try to revise as many concepts as possible. If you are studying this subject for the first time, then it is recommended to go through the entire syllabus properly and thereafter you should watch these revision videos. So I am your mentor for the session. I am Tarun Mahajan. I am a BCom graduate, Diploma in Information Systems Audit. I am also a Chartered Accountant, a Chartered Financial Analyst from United States of America. I am also a Registered Valuer and many more things. So guys, you know that there are various valuation approaches and the name of those approaches are income approach, market approach and the cost approach. There are many valuation standards like international valuation standards, like Red, Red Book issued by the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, like ICAI valuation standards 2018 and many more. And you know, various valuation standards prescribe many, many types of methods of valuation. There can be n number of methods of valuation. There is no limit on number of methods which are available for the purpose of valuation. But as far as approaches are concerned, there are only three possible approaches which are available. And those are income approach, market approach, and the cost approach. Some people also name cost approach as the asset approach. Under income approach, the most popular valuation method is the DCF method that is discounted cash flow method. There may be various other methods like with and without method, multi-period excess earning model, binomial pricing model, black and shoes option pricing model, relief from royalty method. You know, there may be various methods under income approach, but the most popular one is the discounted cash flow method. This is not really new for you. You already know what is DCF, right? From CMA Intermediate, you have been studying this. Try to recall the capital budgeting chapter where you used to calculate net present value. So how do you calculate net present value? You estimate all future cash flows, calculate present value and make some total. That is DCF method, discounted cash flow method. Now, under discounted cash flow method, either you can make valuation of the whole firm or you can make valuation of only equity shares. <coughs> when I say I am making valuation of the whole firm, some people also name it as the enterprise value. Making valuation of the whole firm, firm includes equity shareholders plus preference shareholders plus financiers, that is loan providers, all these people who fund the company, who give finance to the company together are named as firm or the enterprise. Okay. So under DCF method, either you are supposed to make valuation of the firm or you are supposed to make valuation of only equity shares of the company. If you have to make valuation of a firm, then free cash flow, which are available to the firm, FCFF, free cash flow to firm, are discounted with weighted average cost of capital. What is free cash flow to the firm? How do we calculate it? That we will learn. 
What is discounting? It simply means calculating present value. What is VAG? That is KO, overall cost of capital. In CMA Intermediate Cost of Capital chapter, you must have studied about uh, how to calculate overall cost of capital, which is also named as VAG. If you are supposed to make valuation of equity shares, then free cash flow available to equity FCFE is discounted with cost of equity, right? We'll explore everything in detail. This is just the chapter framework I'm discussing. Then under market approach, there can be market price method. If your company share is already listed, then whatever is the is prevailing in the market at which the share is traded is value of the equity. But if your share is not listed, it is unlisted public company or it is a private company. In that case, you use market multiple of comparable companies. Market multiple method. It can be comparable company. It can be a comparable transaction. We'll study that market multiple method. And then there is the cost approach of valuation. See, usually as a valuer, people prefer to use the market approach. If market approach is not feasible, then they prefer to use the income approach. If income approach is also not feasible, then usually cost approach is the last choice. If nothing is feasible, then you do make valuation using cost approach. Under cost approach, two popular methods are replacement cost method and reproduction cost method. Reproduction means how much cost you will have to spend to create ditto same company, same situation, location of the land, same type of building construction, same type of plant and machinery, everything same, ditto same facility if you want to create today. How much money do you need to invest is the reproduction cost. What is replacement cost? Not ditto same, but creating a company with similar capacity. The location of land may be somewhere else. The design of building may be different. Machines may not be German machines. It may be Chinese machine, but the production capacity is 10,000 unit per month. So it is 10,000 unit per month. So creating a same type of company, how much cost you will have to put in that is named as the replacement cost method. You know, if I want to sell my company, I'll say, you know, even if you create it, you'll have to spend 100 crore rupees. So you pay me 100 crore rupees and ready factory, ready company is available. That's the replacement cost or reproduction cost method of valuation. We'll explore everything in detail. You know, most prominent approach practically is income approach. A lot of efforts are required to make valuation using income approach. What are the various steps of valuation under the income approach? See, now forget about the chart mentioned above and let's talk something really simple. Let's talk like a layman. Look, I want to make valuation of something. Maybe I want to make valuation of a cow. Yeah, I'm a farmer or I'm a dairy owner or I'm just a normal citizen. And I want to buy a cow and before buying the cow, I want to make valuation of the cow. That is how much should I be ready to buy that particular cow, right? So value of anything in this world, being equity share or preference share or debenture or convertible debenture or land and building or plant and machinery or inventory or goodwill, or patent, or copyright, or cow, or your value, or my value, value of the room margin. Value of anything and everything is dependent on the future benefit that 
item can give to the owner. If any item can give you huge cash flows, huge income in future, it's valuable. If somebody cannot give you any benefit in future, it is worthless. People make valuation of anything based on their future utility. If you are useful to somebody in future, from their perspective, you are a valuable person. If a building can generate huge rent income in future for you, it's valuable. If an equity share can give dividend and capital gain in future, it's valuable. But if something cannot generate income, cash flow in future, it's not valuable. So value of any item is dependent on its future benefit. Value is nothing but sum of future benefits. But precisely, uh, or exactly better I say, I would like to say that if you want to make valuation of anything in this world, first of all, estimate life. Say you are making valuation of a debenture. So estimate life, sir, debenture will mature in five years. Fantastic. That's the life. I want to make valuation of equity share. Estimate life. Infinite years. Because the going concern assumption is there that the company will remain for. Sir, I want to make valuation of a cow. Okay, so estimate what is the remaining life during which the cow will produce milk. Sir, it's uh, uh, a young cow and expected to produce milk for seven years in future. Okay, so that's the estimated life. Then forecast cash flow. Want to make valuation of debenture? What are your cash inflows, outflows as a debenture holder? Uh, every year I'll receive coupon, that is interest, fine. At the end of fifth year, I'll receive the redemption price, which is par value plus 10% premium. Wow, fantastic. This is forecasted cash flow. You know, forecasting cash flow in case of debenture is very easy because cash flows are fixed. So what about equity shares? I'm valuing equity share. Now that's a tough task. Now, being the equity share, if you wish to hold the share for infinite years, the only cash flow you will have is inflow of dividend. So now you forecast what will be my dividend income year by year. Or you need to forecast free cash flow to equity or free cash flow to firm that we'll explore later. Forecast cash flow. Sir, I'm making valuation of cow. Okay, fine. Then estimate that how much milk it will produce every year. What will be the selling price of milk? How much do you need to feed to this cow? How much will be spent on the uh, health checkup of this cow, right? And uh, various other stuff you need to consider. So forecast those cash flows. Then the next thing is to calculate present value of cash flow. You know, why do we calculate present value of cash flow? Why don't, why don't I do one thing that suppose a debenture will give me 100 rupees dividend, uh -huh, sorry, 100 rupees interest for next five years. And at the end of fifth year, 1000 rupees will be reduction. Suppose a debenture will mature in five years, every year interest payment will be 100 rupees and the amount on redemption is 1000. So why don't I do one thing, 100 rupees, 5 times is 500 rupees, plus 1000 rupees redemption price, this is 1500 rupees. I mean total of future benefits and I say, now this is the current fair value of the debenture, 1500. No, 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 it will go wrong. You know why? Suppose I say, okay, you make some total of three numbers, 10,000 rupees, 10,000 liters, 10,000 kilometers. Come on, make a sum total. You can't do it. Because the unit of measurement is not same. Similarly, if I say you will receive 100 rupees interest at the end of first year, 100 rupees at the end of second year, 100 rupees at the end of third year, 100 rupees fourth year, 1100 rupees fifth year. You're thinking that now the unit of measurement is same? Indian rupees? No, no, no. Absolutely wrong. Unit of measurement is rupees of first year. Rupees of second year. Again, the unit of measurement is not same. 
you cannot make a sum total it is not rupees 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 it is rupees of first year rupees of second year rupees of third year this is just like liters kilometers kilogram etc so first of all you need to convert all cash flow into one unit of measurement that is rupees of zero year and that is what we call calculation of present value so you need to you have estimated life you have forecasted cash flow over the life of the asset. Now calculate present value of all these cash flows. Sir, what should be my discounting rate? Discounting rate should be the desired rate of return of the investor. Discounting rate should be desired rate of return of the investor. That is how much return investor expects from this investment. And once you calculate present value, make a sum total of present value that is actually equal to current fair value of any item right so these are the common step anything and everything in this world can be valued like this rest all approaches are just shortcut for this proper approach i say that market multiple approach is nothing but a shortcut for income approach you know, I repeat, I say that market approach or market multiple method is nothing but just the shortcut for income approach. How? I'll prove it. Suppose you are making valuation of a cow, which is expected to produce milk for next seven years. So life is seven years. Then inflow on sale of milk, outflow on feeding the cow, outflow on other maintenance of the cow, outflow of distribution cost of the milk etc after considering everything you came to the conclusion that every year <clears throat> my cash inflow will be 20,000 rupees for seven years and thereafter it will be zero so now 20,000 rupees per year you will receive for next seven years Suppose making investment in a dairy business is a risky affair. So I need 20% per annum return, you know, estimated life, seven years, forecasted cash flow, rupees 20,000 per annum, net of everything. Now, making investment in dairy business is quite risky. Stay. In that case, <clears throat> your expectation is quite high. You need 20% return on your investment. So you just do one thing. You know, here you calculate sum of present value of all cash flows. So 20,000 rupees should be multiplied by present value and you refactor at the rate of 20% for 7 years. If I solve this, it will be... 20,000 into 3.605 that is 72.092 rupees or let's round it off to 72,000 rupees. So now that's the fair value of a cow. Now you know this forecast of cash flow is based on the assumption that this cow produces 2 liters of milk per day. Hmm? And this cow is valued at 72,000 rupees. You should be ready to pay 72,000 rupees for buying this cow. Okay. Now you can create a market multiple for this. What is market multiple method or market approach? Market multiple is rupees 72,000. That is value divided by value is 72,000 rupees divided by 2 liters per day is 36,000. If another cow is to be valued, say cow B, which produces 3 liters of milk per day on an average, so you'll simply do 3 liters into 36,000, which is rupees 1,8,000. 
So if you already know the value using income approach of some of the assets in the market and you want to make valuation of the other asset, first you calculate the market multiple and thereafter you apply it to your own number. Now this is how the price to earning ratio works. You know that you know a company is listed in the market and you calculate its PE ratio. Now suppose one share of the company is listed at 500 rupees and earning per share is 25 rupees. This is MPS market price per share divided by EPS. So this is 20 times just like this in the numerator you put the value and in the denominator you put your own number 20 times. Now you want to make valuation of other company which is not listed, hence its market price per share is not available. So what do you do? EPS of this company is rupees 10. So you say 10 rupees multiplied by 20 times value should be rupees 200. You know, moral of this whole story is very simple. Income approach is the most generic most fundamental approach and market approach is just a shortcut for the income approach. I just want to say these steps are very important. If you keep it in mind and apply it properly, rest everything will fall in place and you will be able to make valuation easy, right? Great. Now, how to use income approach under various situations. For the sake of your ease of learning, I'm dividing it into two parts. <coughs> there is no such universal classification. I have created this classification so that you can have a better grip on the concept. Using income approach under various situations, valuation of asset with limited life like debentures, limited life. I'm not talking about irredeemable debentures, usual, regular debentures. Regular debentures have limited life. Preferentials have limited life. Plant and machinery has limited life. Building, not land, has limited life. Cow has limited life. Any cattle will have limited life. Your car, two-wheeler, has limited life. And number two, valuation of asset with perpetual life, perpetual debenture, perpetual preferential, which are not allowed to be issued in India, equity shares by its very nature. Then even for perpetual life asset, is we can divide it into three parts. Assets where the cash flows are constant. Company is giving dividend of rupees. 5 per share for infinity years it is expected. This is one case. Cash flow will grow at a constant rate. Life is infinite. But every year you will not receive constant amount. You will receive ever growing amount. But the growth rate itself is constant. Right from the beginning. So first year company paid a dividend of rupees 10 per share. And then it will increase by 10% per annum. First year it is 10 rupees. Second year it is 11 rupees. Third year it will be 12.1 rupees. Fourth year it will be 13.31 rupees. And so on. Dividend is growing. But growth rate is constant. And then the situation where cash flow will initially grow at a higher rate. And thereafter, it will grow at a constant rate for it. For first three years, four years, five years, six years, the growth rate is variable, the growth rate is very high. And thereafter, the growth rate becomes constant. So these are the various situations we will try to comprehend that how to use income approach under these situations. <laughs>